Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, <laughs> I was actually originally wanted to only uh, do 10 minutes of opening remarks, maybe even five minutes of opening remarks. Uh, but Stanley recommended we do 20, and therefore I'm going to subject you to the entire history of freedom of speech on campus, at least all that I know of it. Um, I started at FIRE in 2001, and uh, so I'm going to refer to this is for a free speech under attack on, on college campuses. So I'm going to have to gonna go fairly quickly um, uh, to, to, to cover all of it. So I refer to this section as prehistory. Um, and what I mean by prehistory is before I have personal experience with what's going on on campus. But the main thing you need to know about free speech on college campus prehistory before 2001 is that it was very well established that free speech is very well protected on American college campuses. Now, of course, there's the private-public distinction. Private colleges are bound by their promises. Uh, actually, in the state of California, though, um, non-sectarian schools are bound by the First Amendment. That's due to all this particular law in California. Um, so it wouldn't apply to USD. But since 1957, um, uh, if not earlier, the Supreme Court has found that free speech um, and academic freedom are strongly protected on campuses. Now, I'm going to show you a slide to convey how strongly. This is a cartoon for which a student was uh, kicked out of school in the uh, early 1970s. It's a cartoon of cops raping the Statue of Liberty and the Goddess of Justice. The Supreme Court found this unquestionably protected on the basis of the fact that offense alone cannot uh, make something unprotected speech at an American university. So it's very strong. It is not uh, subject to being overruled by someone merely being offended. So I'm going to get into now the phases I've seen in my career. So starting in 2001, uh, it was very consistent that the kind of case, if you were going to get in trouble on a college campus, it wasn't because faculty wanted to shut you up. It wasn't because students wanted to shut you up. It was generally because of uh, administrators. It was, it was administrative overreach time and time again. Now, this is a case at uh, up north at Modesto Junior College, where a student who was trying to hand out copies of the US Constitution on September 17th, also known as Constitution Day, was told that he was not allowed to hand out copies of the Constitution without prior advance notice. And, he, and even then, he would be limited to a tiny free speech zone on campus. You don't need to be a First Amendment lawyer to know that this is laughably unconstitutional. And this was more typical of the kind of cases I was dealing with. Now, some of them do fit the um, I have a right not to be offended scenario. Uh, so, but a lot of these cases don't necessarily work out how um, people would think they would, they would work out given sort of stereotypes of political correctness on campus. My very first letter at FIRE um, that I sent was on behalf of a professor at University of New Mexico um, who on 9-11 joked, anybody who can blow up the Pentagon has my vote. Now, this is a professor who was known for being really acerbic, for being very funny in his class. Um, and he immediately apologized for it. Um, but he chose not to fight any action taken against him. And by that summer, he was out of a job. Um, he actually yeah, got a rare um, look into the future uh, from this professor. He wrote a paper um, that uh, summer saying, I should have listened to fire. I should have actually fought, because uh, free speech was actually on my side. So and then, of course, there are speech codes, um, campus speech codes very roughly defined as codes that violate what would be protected speech um, under the First Amendment. Um, and so some examples of this, this one is actually still in place at uh, University of West Alabama. It bans harsh text messages or emails. Now, hopefully, and uh, as the years go by, I find that people understand less and less what's objectionable about this, because it's like, that sounds nice. Um, every single one of you in this office uh, sorry, in this room could be found guilty of violating this because it's merely someone's interpretation of whether or not it's, it's a harsh text message or email. Um, it allows for massive abuse and you should not trust administrators with these kind of powers. Now, a code that's popped up twice and had to be uh, struck, uh, struck down once at University of Connecticut and then popped up again many years later at, universe, at, at Drexel University in Philadelphia banned the use of derogatory jokes, um, inconsiderate uh, jo jokes, and inappropriately directed laughter. The fact that this literally popped up twice um, over the course of 15 years is absolutely uh, stunning to me. So in, back in 2007, when we got our first serious data set of speech codes, we found that over, uh, around 75% of universities that we surveyed, and we based them on the most populous schools in the country and also the top 100 liberal arts colleges, according to US News and World Reports, 
we found that about 75% of colleges at the time maintained laughably unconstitutional speech codes. Now, I'm gonna come back to this example, but to give you another ex idea of what, kind, what we mean by speech uh, code, these are some free speech zones. Um, in the bottom corner is uh, the very <laughs> sad um, uh, Texas Tech University free speech gazebo. Uh, 20 foot wide area on campus where we, <laughs> which was the only place where students were allowed uh, to protest or hand out materials. I had a friend who has a degree in math from MIT uh, do the, the dimensional analysis on this and if God forbid all 28,000 students wanted to exercise their free speech rights at once at Texas Tech University, they would have to be crushed down to the density of uranium 238. <laughs> and he was deadly serious. He was like, no, no, that's about the density. Um, there's this, the Free Speech Swamp at University of Hawaii at Hilo, where students were trying to protest the NSA or hand out copies of the Constitution. Um, there's this one where students were trying to, uh, at the University of Cincinnati, see the big green uh, pin. They were trying to pass out uh, a, a ballot initiative. Um, they were trying to get signatures for a ballot initiative that was two days um, in the future, and they were told that they would be arrested. These were students at University of Cincinnati if they were seen, quote unquote, walking around campus um, for trying to, uh, to petition the government for redress of grievances, which might sound uh, familiar to some of you. And the single saddest looking <laughs> free speech zone I have ever seen is Blinn College in um, uh, Texas. That's that one oh, in the corner. The speech zone is not, uh, not that entire vast area you see in the picture, but just the two squares on either side of that sad looking bulletin board. Uh, we actually have to uh, go into court in order to get that, uh, the university to back down on that one. Now, again, these are not hard cases. So now there's phase two. Uh, phase two is when you start seeing the Department of Education come out with um, definitions of harassment that actually necessarily required punishing protected speech. Uh, this was something that university had claimed my entire career, that the Department of Education was making them pass these ridiculous codes, which was, of course, a ridiculous thing to say. But then, unfortunately, um, starting in 2011 and 2013, you start having guidance coming out of the Department of Education um, that required, frankly, a ridiculously unconstitutional national speech code. They removed all the protections um, that were normally uh, around harassment and just said if it's unwelcome, con uh, unwelcome verbal conduct, also known as speech of a sexual nature, whether it's offensive to an average person or not, if it's just subjectively offensive to you, these are, this eviscerates the normal protections uh, put around what, what harassment is defined as. And understand that in a lot of states, this is immediately applied to 17 different categories. Mo Montana, for example, applies it to uh, speech that is unwelcome based on politics. <laughs> Which is like, okay, so you've just passed a national speech code that basically means any opinion you have potentially could be under threat. And that's the way it has worked out. Um, so North, what, anyone familiar with the case of Laura Kipnis? Practically nobody. And one hand went up. That's amazing. Okay. So Laura Kipnis is a feminist professor at Northwestern University. Thank you, Stanley. At Northwestern University. She wrote an article that was critical of overreach um, from, by Title IX. And she found herself uh, in, an, in a secret Title IX investigation for violating Title IX for being critical of the overreach of Title IX. <laughs> she then wrote, and she wrote, she wrote an article about it. They abandoned the, uh, once it went public, they abandoned the, the whole shenanigans. Then she wrote a book about it, and they launched an investigation about her again, um, which we're currently in, uh, currently in the middle of fighting. So it ended, ended up having a lot of interesting ramifications. And by the way, it's not, weird in my experience that even a, a law passed to protect women is consistently being used against women, often feminist women. So a case that we're currently in litigation at right now is a professor um, uh, here at Louisiana State University, Terry Buchanan, who was fired under the blueprint standard. We're still in litigation about that. And it's just kind of crazy that, we're, that we would even have to go to court on, on some of this stuff. So, okay, phase three. This is when people really started paying attention. And this, I have to admit, roils me a little bit because the media didn't pay a lot of attention to what was going on on campus until it was the students themselves um, that were demanding people be disinvited, um, that uh, you know, demanding trigger warnings or microaggression uh, training and that kind of stuff. And it was kind of weird because once it sort of better fit a conservative stereotype of what the situation on campus was, it, it suddenly got better coverage both from you know, Fox News, but also from MSNBC, which was a little bit strange that it, that it took that happening. But it is true, disinvitations 
went up. Disinvitations, as in and what we define dis disinvitations are, are attempts to get speakers disinvited because you don't like their point of view. Now, what you see here is a graph of uh, right versus left. Um, people on the right demanding that someone not speak on your campus and people from the left uh, not, not speaking on your campus. And if you could look at it, you can see that it's actually not that different from left to right um, on campus until the media really started noticing it. And so fire started noticing it after 2012. And as you can see, 2016 was the highest point we've seen in disinvitation pushes in, in, in my career. So that is an attitude change. Prior to 2013, 2014, the single best constituency for free speech on college campus was not professors, it definitely wasn't administrators, it certainly wasn't university presidents, it was students, and that has changed. Um, this is where you first start hearing stories about uh, microaggression policies, like the one at UCLA, that lists things um, like uh, America's a melting pot. I believe the most qualified person should get the job, uh, should get the job as a form of aggression against the oppressed. Now, this is I understand to some degree because this is kind of sexy stuff, and it is a little strange. But I was used to much more severe uh, punishments um, than this. Um, so then there's what, what we're, when uh, we wrote, wrote our first article with John Haidt. Um, it was one of the reasons why we wrote it was because we saw this big spike in attempts to medicalize the excuses for censorship, that essentially they were using models of trauma, models of PTSD to say that we can't have the speech on campus anymore because it's medically harming. So we wrote an article called Coddling the American Mind, a title I've never liked <laughs> I and mean, still don't like. But it was basically saying that not only is this wrong, not only does this misunderstand the science of trauma and the science of, uh, of basic psychology, I, I co-wrote it with a, um, a, a famous psychologist, John Haidt, um, that it gets, the, uh, it gets psychology exactly backwards. That essentially if you tell somebody that they're very frail and that they're never going to recover again if they hear something uh, that, that really offends them, that is doing them a massive psychological disservice. And it's not something that any psychologist would ever actually tell you. So basically what we were seeing was this disempowerment of students. That essentially they were being told um, the reason why a lot of the censorship was happening was partially because people in K through 12 or other administrators were more or less telling them that if someone comes and really says something that challenged your point of view, you could be permanently harmed. That's insulting and it's wrong in our opinion. And also the science backs us up. Now, 2015, 2015 protests really captured a lot of attention. Um, and it's partially because it was really the first time in my career that there was a very strong uh, racial component to what was going on in the protest. And the protests themselves, I was really excited to see a lot of them because I, I'm a First Amendment guy, I love protests. But what was distressing was that in a substantial number of the cases, they weren't just asking for you know, more money to the departments that they cared about. They were asking for particular faculty to be fired for what they said, staff to be fired for what they said. And in this case, asking for the student newspaper to be defunded because they published an article of someone who was critical of Black Lives Matter. Now, if you were to read the article, um, you know, it was probably about as mainstream as you're going to get on, on, uh, with that point of view. It was someone trying to respectfully say that they actually dis they disagree. And what we didn't know is this was going to lead to, um, this was the first step in a very uh, kind of intense couple of months of protests, some of which were great, some of which were not so great. <laughs> um, does anybody remember this person? Okay, so this is Melissa Click. This is the person who asked for, uh, let's get some muscle over here when, God forbid, a student tried to cover the protests at University of Missouri at Mizzou. Um, she was a communications professor. Uh, shouldn't be telling people to get muscle to get rid of student reporters. So phase five. Um, <laughs> there, are, there are six phases. Or are, are there seven? Oh, well, I'll find out as I go. So phase five is very new. Um, and if you'll notice, these phases are getting closer and closer together. <laughs> They're like contractions. They're just getting, um, and what, it's one of the reasons why I, we're real, I think people are really noticing this. And for the first time in my career, um, 2017 was the first time I saw real violence on campus. And in working on the book, um, I uh, had to watch a lot of videos of, of, of the you know, so-called Milo riots. And they were a lot worse than I thought. I went to Stanford. I uh, lived in the Bay Area for a long time. I went to Burning Man seven times. I know like a lot of the kind of people who would have been in the anti-Milo crowd. But 
the idea of taking it out on people who were there to see the show was not what I was expecting. And they're very lucky nobody got killed at that. This includes hitting someone with a, um, a flagpole right across the top head, big, big pool of blood. Um, and what's amazing is a lot of, some of the students who were assaulted, these were people who didn't like Milo. <laughs> They actually were very much on record just trying to see what would actually happen, and they were assaulted, you know, nonetheless, because that's what happens when things get out of control. So incidents across the country include uh, the shutting down of Heather McDonald, um, which uh, happened at, I think, uh, Claremont McKenna College, where it was actually physically, where students actually physically um, blocked entrance to her speech so it couldn't go on. There was, uh, of course, the incident in Middlebury, where Allison Stanger was badly hurt uh, while trying to defend Charles Murray, <laughs> um, the right to speak on our campus, which is just, the I'm laughing, because Allison Stanger does not agree with Charles Murray on anything. She invited him to him to Middlebury so she could debate him, but she ended up uh, having to go to the hospital with concussion. She has injuries that she suffered from this day, to this day because one of the protesters uh, grabbed her hair and pulled her down to the ground. Um, and uh, once again, like with the uh, Milo riots, I think uh, I think maybe two people were arrested for the Milo riots. And in this case, I'm not sure if the person who actually insulted, uh, assaulted um, Allison Stanger was ever actually charged with anything. So, and then of course we have the horror of Charlottesville. Easily one of the most horrifying things I have seen in my career. So the temperature is going up a lot. So now I'm getting why people are paying more attention to this. It's getting pretty, uh, pretty scary. And then you see a phase, this is the most recent phase, um, what I would call sort of the backlash phase. This is when you have this sort of weird um, interaction between the uh, echo chamber of higher education and the echo chamber of sort of like the conservative media. We all, could, by the way, we all now live in uh, relatively thick echo chambers and communities that are more politically polarized than they were you know, 30, 40 years ago. And this is a case in which a professor uh, who wasn't even behind an event, went on Tucker Carlson, and she defended a party that was being thrown off campus that was for uh, black students only. And she went on because she didn't want some, some other person going on who couldn't defend it as well. And she basically just said, oh, poor white students are not invited to this party. We have every right to invite whoever we want. And she was fired after going on Tucker Carlson um, for this. Uh, so th these, are, these are some of the backlash cases we're seeing, including this professor from Princeton um, who actually bowed out of a speech at Northwestern after rece receiving really horrifying death threats because she had made a speech that was uh, very critical of Donald Trump. So things are, <laughs> we're, this is a pretty dangerous combustible mixture we have going on here. Um, and at the same time, uh, one of the things that I see more on campus than off campus is just this idea that um, we need to give the government more power uh, to police speech. This has always st struck me as mind boggling, particularly when I'm with my friends in San Francisco, when I have to explain it. So you understand what you're saying is you think the Trump administration should have more power to police speech they don't like. And they just always assume it's going to be enforced by someone that they, they agree with. And it's just, it's a very difficult argument to understand. But I'm going to talk about, the, so the conclusion, uh, what I mean by that is that all of these trends, none of them have stopped. <laughs> I'm still dealing with administrative cases. I'm still dealing with uh, cases of uh, student-led censorship. I'm still dealing with cases uh, involving the abuse of Title IX. I'm still dealing with cases um, that, that are similar to all these, and then some that don't even fit any narrative at all. But I wanted to give you at least some good news. Speech codes have decreased on campus by a lot. Um, they're actually, this is the 2017 report. Uh, so I told you it was 75% when we first started doing um, our study of it. It's now down actually to 31% um, in, the, in the last year, which is, which is great. And that's due to, frankly, a ton of lawsuits, not just by FIRE, but by other organizations. So that's, that's good news. The not so good news is that you have a lot of incidents that look just like the cases we've seen in the past. This is the Brett Weinstein case at Evergreen State University. Um, that was definitely, if you, if you, I can't cover all of that in one sitting. We just did a podcast with them uh, at thefire.org. You can check it out. It's kind of an amazing case. Um, then, there, you know, like, as I said, there are cases that just don't fit anyone's narrative. Um, and FIRE is, of course, fighting these all the time. This is Northern Michigan University. Um, they had a policy of threatening students with punishment if they were, uh, if they'd gone to the counseling center, they would receive a scary letter from the university uh, the disciplinary office saying, hi, we heard that you went to the counseling center. Um, by the way, if you talk about ideas of self-harm with any of your, uh, any of your friends, um, you can face serious punishment for that. 
Let that think, <laughs> sink in. Someone is telling someone, possibly who is depressed, oh, by the way, um, don't be a burden on your friends and isolate yourself, okay? That's insane. You, you need to actually look these things up um, to, to know that that's not good advice to give someone who's depressed. We understand that they're worried about the idea of contagion. This is not the way you, you handle that. And this is much more coldly deployed out of fear of litigation, uh, in, in our opinion. Uh, we managed to get this policy dismantled, which uh, it's, it still, it fits nobody's political narrative. And now we're sort of, everything is everything old is new again. As Stanley can well attest, a lot of the first First Amendment cases um, that were the, the, in which there was a strong interpretation of free speech under the First Amendment uh, were cases involving um, people who were anti-capitalists, who were anarchists, who were Bolsheviks. And we, the, we're just in litigation right now for a student who was arrested at Joliet Junior College in Illinois for trying to hand out anti-capitalist flyers, arrested for. It. We could hardly we could hardly believe uh, that just trying to find out flyers it would reach the point where we're sufficiently uh, far away from a, a strong idea of free speech that this you know this barely made any headlines it didn't fit people's narrative people didn't quite get it and meanwhile we're litigating this case for obvious wrong um, unambiguously protected um, at a at a public college and and because it doesn't quite fit the existing narrative people aren't paying attention. So he, that's my, my short history of free speech on college campuses. Um, here is my uh, contact information. Here's my um, uh, Twitter information. Uh, always feel free to uh, shoot me an email. Um, I always have uh, fun uh, talking with, uh, uh, with Stanley. And uh, at that, I'll, I'll give it over to Stanley. <laughs>